Welcome back to the show. As I said, we're going to stay on that topic of, of health and in particular talk about eating and, and eating disorders. And I am joined by registered dietitian from the Balance Practice, Marie-Pierre Pitra Diorio. Welcome to the show, Marie-Pierre. Great so to much. have you here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when, when do we start having a concern, right? Because I, I think there, there are so many things out there available when you look at diets and, you know, people looking up things. To, when, when, does, when does it become an issue where we start looking at it as more of an eating disorder rather than, you know, you're just trying to lose weight or, or, or getting on a diet of some kind? Yeah, that's a really, really good question because the culture that we live in, you're right, really, there's a lot of emphasis on dieting and on weight and on being healthy. So like the lines can be blurred when it's like mm -hmm. becoming an eating disorder. And oftentimes early signs of eating disorders can be missed because of diet culture and where we live in. So when we think of early signs or how we know when it's gone like too far, there's a few things that we'll look into. A lot of it is like the intention behind the behavior. And a bigger part of that is how much is impacting the individual is having the eating disorder. Right. So we'll see things of like if I'm choosing to eat healthy versus if I'm obsessed with eating healthy and like I can't not eat healthy and then it becomes like very black and white thinking, very rigid and their world slowly becomes smaller because then it's hard to connect with other people. It's hard to go out, be social because right. the whole life becomes around, you know, the way that they eat, maybe the way that they look, how they feel, like everything becomes much harder. And do you find, Maripia, they don't see it in themselves, right? Because I think, you know, when, when somebody sort of goes down that path and they look at themselves in the mirror, they may see it as a positive, what they're seeing, but yeah. the rest of us don't necessarily see that. Yeah, right? and I would actually say like at the beginning, I think most people would see it as a positive, right? A right. lot of people, if right. you lose weight or anything happens, you're praised and you're like, yeah, this is so good, like congratulations. Whereas the person on the inside, like, although like they may have some insight that like, man, this is really hard or like I'm struggling, but I'm getting all this positive validation. Mm. So I'm continuing to do it. But there is a lot of folks with eating disorders that there is a period of deny, right? Of like of where we, we're in denial. We're not like seeing how impactful it is because the eating disorders, although we don't like it, it's an illness, it still serves a purpose. And for a lot of folks with eating disorder, it comes out as a way to cope. So when right. life can get really wild, really crazy, the eating disorder can come help as like a way to control, a way to I have see. something that is like helpful, although we know it's not helpful long term, can still be helpful in that moment. Yeah, and I, and I think in, in a lot of cases, like in these types of discussions, we talk about environment versus genetics. Mm -hmm. Where does that fall into when it, when it comes to an eating disorder? Yeah, so there's definitely both. So there okay. is a genetic component to, to, with when folks have an eating disorder, like oftentimes like there is definitely someone in their family who's had an eating disorder, like there is that genetic piece. Okay. However, genetic alone is not enough to develop an eating disorder. So they often like will say with like it's like a gun without like being loaded like the environment really loads the gun. Okay. Um, so someone who has a genetic d doesn't mean that they will develop an eating disorder. However, the environment that we're in is like the biggest factor, I would say, um, especially nowadays, especially post COVID. There's just like a lot of pieces that will put someone at risk. And especially like we've named like living and diet culture where like diets, food, bodies are things that a lot of people are very hyper focused on. It can mm -hmm. put, put someone even more at risk of developing an eating disorder. Um what about things to, you know, prevention? Uh, you know, yeah. if let's say we do know it's it's genetic, for instance, um, to stay away from those environmental factors, what are what are ways we can we can go about doing that? Yeah, that's a really good question because there is risk factors, but then we can also protect ourselves and within the environment, which is always what we would look at. Okay. So things that are protective, like if you are a parent or a loved one of someone with an eating disorder, is really setting the environment where we're talking positively about food, talking positively about bodies. The people that we hang out with like we know that modeling so knowing someone who has an eating disorder is a big influencer as well right um, but then also working like on our self-esteem and like having good coping mechanism right so when we are able to like regulate our own emotions like all of those things can be very positive and protective because we may not need the eating disorder as much or there's less li chances of it developing if we have other copings and other things that are supportive for us. I think, you know, part of the issue too when it comes to eating disorder, there's a lot of myths around it, right? And, yes. and um, I'm glad we have you on because <laughs> I'd like you to sort of maybe dispel some of those myths. So so what are some of the myths, you know, surrounding that subject? Yeah, matter? I think the biggest myth for me that I see in my practice is the idea that eating disorders have a look. 
that right. folks who have eating disorders are like very thin people, typically white females. And that causes a lot of harm because actually 86% of people with eating disorders actually don't live in a thin body. They live in standard size or larger size bodies. But if you're someone with an eating disorder and you believe that to have a serious eating disorder, I need to be thin, it causes a lot of harm because the person may not actually go access care because they don't believe that they're like sick enough or it's not as important. Right. But that's really not true. Like eating disorders come in all size, shapes, gender, ages. Like there's no one size fits all for an eating disorder. Like right. it does not discriminate. Um, so I would say like that is the biggest myth that I'd love for us to like talk about more because it's important. It's important to know that like, eating disorders just look very, very differently on everyone. Yeah, and you know, on that is, is an eating disorder only considered when you're stop eating and you're not eating, or is it also considered an eating disorder when you're eating too much? You're, you're, you're overeating, and then for whatever reason, maybe it's stress and anxiety, and then that's the way that you deal with it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, under eating or restrictive eating is like one type of eating yeah. disorders, right? Yeah. There's all these other things too. So there's definitely like binge eating, but there's also things like restrictive and like maybe compensating with exercise, or there can be like some purging behaviors. There could also be like some restriction that has nothing to do with food but more like textures or anxieties around food or fear of like being sick when we eat right so it's not just like wanting to restrict because you want to lose weight um, that can be part of it but there's like you said like a, a lot of other behaviors around food right so I like to say it's really like when our behaviors around food start impeding our life quality Right, like right. my relationship to food is impeding the way that I show up, my relationships, um, that's when really we see like, it may not be a diagnosed eating disorder, but like it is disordered eating, right? Like yeah, your relationship with food is no longer empowering you to live. It's like kind of taking away and that's when we need to get help. Um, you know, for somebody that's watching now and they kind of recognize it within themselves, yeah. w what's a great place to go? What's a good resource for them? Yeah, so there are a lot more resources out there, which is really, really great. Um, I would say a registered dietitian is someone to look out to. Like our practice, the balanced practice, we specialize in eating disorder care, okay. so that could be something to look at. You can also look at free resources, like there's Body Brave or there's like Net Canada um, that are supporting with groups and different information. Right. Um, I think just getting the conversation started for sure, if you recognize your yourself and what we're talking about today I yeah. think is a big step. Agreed. Thanks so much for joining. I really appreciate it. We'll be right Thank back you. after this.